Well, it was extraordinary. I mean, George Bernard Shaw at that time, as you know, uh, early 30s, was probably one, if not the most significant personality on this earth. Mm. He had become famous, some people said notorious, as a leader of world opinion. And he'd written many of the greatest plays in our language. But it happened that he was on the board of governors of the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art. Mm. And unlike most of our board of governors, he came very frequently. I always remember the first time I caught sight of him was when he was coming into the front hall of the Royal Academy at a moment when I happened to be crossing uh, the staircase which leads down into the front hall. And the front hall porter of the Royal Academy, a very posh looking individual who used to wear a top hat and a frock coat and all that, was rash enough to offer Shaw a ride in the lift, at which Shaw this marvellously healthy-looking chap in a uh, tweed uh, suit, he said to the, to the hall porter, Nonsense, boy, you know I never use that sort of machinery. I always go up the stairs under my own steam. Indeed, I'll race you up the stairs. And he started to, to race the <laughs> hall porter up the stairs. And of course, we were absolutely staggered. And so, at once, we realised that this was no ordinary human being. George Bernard Shaw. And n before long, we, n we became to realize that whenever we were doing one of his plays, he would come and see rehearsals. And indeed, one of the first, I, I'm not sure if it was in my first term, but quite one of the first plays of his that we did was his uh, uh, rather short play called Androcles and the Lion. Mm. And I played the very effective part of the lion. Mm. And Shaw came uh, to the Royal Academy uh, uh, to our rather grubby rehearsal room, rather dusty wooden floors and you know, not at all a salubrious kind of surrounding. And I also remember uh, his exquisite courtesy to us. This was a staggering thing. Here was one of, if not the most significant personality on this planet. And he talked to us as if we were equals, called us Mr. This or Miss That. Mr. Morse, he was calling me, snotty-nosed, cockney kid of 15. Yeah, and uh, I th So in no time at all, of course, we, we accepted him as a well-wishing companion. And uh, I always remember his coming to one of our rehearsals of Androcles and the Lion, when I was playing the Lion, and in his exquisitely cut tweed suit, he lay on his back on the floor, waving his arms and legs in the air to show me how the lion should behave when, as he put it, <laughs> when he wants his tummy tickled. <laughs> well, of course, you've got to love a man oh. like that, haven't you? And uh, mm. not too f long afterwards, um, we, um, those of us who were new students at the Royal Academy, became rather disenchanted with the standard and, 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 and methods of instruction because at that time, the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art had become used far too frequently as a kind of finishing school for elegant young ladies. In those days, families with social pretensions would send their daughters, quite often, to Switzerland to be taught how to move gracefully and speak more or less intelligibly and stuff like that. Well, those families that didn't choose or couldn't afford to send their daughters to Switzerland would send them to the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art. Mm. So there are all these very elegant, posh, sweet-smelling girls, who, uh, 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 delicious, of course, for a letterous <laughs> kid like me, but th they weren't exactly <laughs> potentially brilliant actresses. Mm. And so we realized that there were, well, to start with, there were four girl students for, to every ma male student. And I was the youngest student in the place. So that pro disproportion of girls to fellas was delicious for me, but from an artistic point of view, it wasn't exactly what the doctor ordered. And so we formed a student council. And I suppose partly because I was so pushy and truculent, but also partly because I realized I had a certain amount of what they nowadays call street smarts, having grown up you know, as, as I had. <coughs> I was elected one of the chairpersons of this student council, although I was the youngest student. And 
we tried to formulate a kind of new policy which might improve the quality of instruction of actors at the Royal Academy. And, of course, a natural ally to seek was our friend George Bernard Shaw. So we, con we contrived to arrange an appointment with him at uh, the uh, uh, place where he lived in Whitehall Court in London in those days. And uh, we were given an appointment by his secretary, Miss Blanche Patch. And along we went at the appointed time. Uh, my co-chairperson, this young lady, uh, and I, uh, we, we went along for this appointment with George Bernard Shaw. And uh, we were shown in. Uh, and he received us very graciously in his study there. And we told him, in a rather grambling, gabbling sort of way, all our misgivings about the present standard of, of tuition at the Royal Academy. And he listened to us uh, very patiently. And then he said, yes, I, I understand. He always had this beautifully eloqu uh, eloquent and, and purely produced voice. He said, yes, I do understand your preoccupations. And it seems to me that the first thing that you must produce is a manifesto. Well, we didn't know quite what that meant, a manifesto. He saw, of course, at once, while well, we didn't fully understand. In, in other words, you must write out, chapter by chapter, paragraph by paragraph, what your concerns are about the shortcomings of the Royal Academy and what your proposals would be for attempting to correct them, or something like that, he said. Uh, and then he said, I, uh, we, we looked suitably bemused, of course, and so he said, I'll give you a few notes. And so I always remember he reached out and took uh, two or three sheets of this quarter-sized green scribble paper, which he used. Mm. It's not commonly known that Shaw had a form of um, a visual impairment which caused him severe headaches once in a while, mostly through uh, the eye strain inco uh, incurred through writing 15, 16 hours a day, you know. And so on this green paper, he then wrote a kind of series of headings of what we'd been talking to him about, about there being too many students and too many students who weren't seriously intentioned and all of that stuff. And he wrote all these various chapter headings, and he gave us these bits of paper and said, <coughs> get some friend of yours who can work a typewriter to copy these out for you and then present them to the principal of the Royal Academy, who no doubt will in future present it to us, the Board of Governors, and you may be required to attend, so be prepared. So we said, yes, sir, of course, sir, yes. We went away thanking him, and we found a friend who could work a typewriter, who typed it all up for us, and then we threw the bits of green paper away. Oh, now that, uh, staggeringly, mm -hmm. is a supreme proof of how we accepted him as a well-wishing friend, mm -hmm. not as a world figure. We didn't treasure these things and say, we'll give them to the British Museum or that. Our charm had written this out for us, and now we, we did, followed his advice, and indeed we did. We, we took our type, typewritten copies of all of this, presented them uh, to the principal, and sure enough, in the passage of time, uh, there was a Board of Governors meeting called, at which we were required to attend, to explain our manifesto. And I always remember this beautiful Shavian situation. We go to this Board of Governors meeting, and there are all these posh people sitting around this long table, and our principal is there, and he's a garrulous old snob called Kenneth Barnes. Uh, he, uh, he only had re re real interest in not what people's theatrical gifts were, but what their family links were. He was a terrible, terrible snob. If, if your father happened to be a duke, or if your uncle was a baron this, or you know, b b b earl that, you, you got the best parts. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, he knew that I was as common as muck, and so he was always deeply opposed to me in any sense. But anyway, he was there, and of course I was there as chief troublemaker, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and, and they had copies of our manifesto, largely written by George Bernard Shaw, which they passed around to all the Board of Governors, uh, and they were all more or less non-committal or dismissive, you know, they were all elegant leading figures of the theatre of, of those times. Uh, and George Bernard Shaw himself was there, down at the end of the table. Mm -hmm. And eventually this document comes to him. And after all these other people had said more or less dismissive things, he then said, 
Well, now it seems to me that these young people have raised some very interesting and challenging thoughts about the institution of the Royal Academy. Uh, there are many desirable things which ought to be paid attention to and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> <laughs>